Okay, let's continue where we left off. Okay, we'll turn to Buddhist schools. What are the major schools of Buddhism? Buddhism in Southeast Asia is often labeled Theravada, or Orthodox Buddhism. And Northeast Asia, most subscribe to Mahayana Buddhism, meaning the big boat or greater path, which offers a more accessible way to follow Buddha's message compared to Theravada, which is called Hinayana, or small boat Buddhism, by greater path Buddhists. People outside Asia or are, are most likely to meet greater path Buddhists or Mahayana Buddhists. Uh, so those of us in the United States, uh, Buddhists that come from Asia more likely come from places where, where they're uh, more likely to be Mahayana than Theravada. And if uh, those of you that are Buddhists, probably more of you are Mahayana than Theravada also. Uh, followers of the greater path claim that their beliefs provide hope to the widest possible number of people. Salvation is not only for holy saints, but is achievable to everyone. The greater path put the needs or puts the needs of the masses first and um, made Buddhist teachings obtainable to all. My goal in keeping with Buddha's loving heart. Anyone can attain the truth, not just the devout or not just monks that can renounce uh, a worldly lifestyle, um, those also that live a normal lifestyle. The Greater Path announces that anyone who seeks Buddha can find salvation. One Greater Path uh, parable echoes Christ's parable of the prodigal son. Hopefully you've heard of that before. Uh, in the Buddhist version, a young person travels to the other side of the world, only to face poverty and problems. The child's father finds his child begging on the street, but the child does not recognize his father and assumes he is a king. The father sends his associate to offer the child a job to clean the street. Over time, the father makes sure that his child is promoted and eventually becomes his accountant. Even then, the child does not realize that it is the father's love that is helping him. Finally, when the child is stable, the father reveals who he is and welcomes the child back into full fellowship. In the same way, Buddha hides among humanity as a humble teacher so we can learn from him about our soul's condition. At the Sixth Buddhist World Council, participants focused on how Missionaries could take the Buddhist message worldwide. Long before the problems, or long before the conference, however, Buddhists had been resident in Europe and North America. There were Buddhist societies in England as early as 1906. And today, every major city in Europe and North America has Buddhist shrines and followers. What flourishes today is a wide breadth of experiences of meditation, devotion, philosophy, ethics, and faith and practice. Any quest for the historical Buddha is impossible to achieve using modern historiographic standards. Um, the records from Buddha came from much later, so it's very hard to know how much is historical. And it does not meet the standards that we'd have today for history. Buddha's life is shrouded um, in devotion, myth, and parable. The story of Buddha's life, however, is not about what happened in history, but about how the teachings of Buddhism have been expressed in various cultures worldwide. It can be said with certainty that 
Siddhartha Gautama was one of the most influential people in history, probably in the top five. Entire civilizations have been affected by his message. Here we offer an introduction for learners from a non-Buddhist background who are willing to enjoy the fragrances of Buddhism's thousand-petaled lotus. Again, going back to that metaphor of Buddhism as a flower with many different petals uh, or many different varieties, it is hoped that those of us who are not Buddhists will be met with graciousness by our Buddhist sisters and brothers. So in terms of this class, um, ideally I would like to learn from any of you that are Buddhists, I don't really have much of a chance to do that since we're online, not in person, but uh, I invite you to let me know of uh, anything maybe that I have not understood correctly about Buddhism. So especially later on in the class, when you're going over more of the concepts, uh, it's always possible there's something that's I misunderstood that I would like to learn better. So I invite you to correct me if I I misunderstood something, especially those of you that are Buddhists. All right, we'll turn now to chapter three, which is about the life of the Buddha. And this is the from the Mahayana or Greater Path doctrines of the Buddha. Buddhist scriptures are called the fathers and mothers of the faith because they explain the teachings of Buddha. Buddha, whom we regard as a historical figure, not just a legend, um, is but one of an infinite series of Buddhas, according to this, uh, this teaching. When Christians draw parallels between Buddha and Christ, this ahistorical nature of the Buddha should be kept in mind. Um, so we do believe Buddha himself is a, is a historical person, but much that we know, or much many of the accounts are ahistorical because we can't really confirm the historical accuracy um, there are no original writings from the time Buddha lived. Further, theological categories such as revelation, theism, atheism, and polytheism convey much more about Christianity than they do about Buddhism. The faith of millions of Buddhists should be defined on its own unique terms. Is Buddha considered a god? The concept of an almighty and permanent God who created all things is in contradiction to Buddhist teachings. Buddhists, Buddhism does not teach that. Uh, such a view, however, however, is more agnostic than atheistic because the question is of little concern for Buddhists. Instead of considering who is responsible for creation, Buddhists focus on the question of how life is best lived. Buddhism is a pragmatic psychology focusing on helping individuals use meditation practices to find freedom from suffering. Buddha is given the honorific title Lord as a term of respect, but it has a different meaning from its use in Christianity, um, which links it more to the idea of God. Buddha insisted he was not a prophet or an expression of God, but only a teacher who had become awake or enlightened. He was a pathfinder who taught that anyone could find what he had discovered. Buddha did not seek to be worshipped, but instead offered himself as a tour guide through the dangers of life. Sometimes the term Buddha nature is used to describe what people in other religions refer to as God, a powerful energizing source that sustains life. The entire world is filled with the Buddha nature in this sense, or according to this theology. Uh, when a person is filled with the Buddha nature, they are enlightened, free from suffering. Buddha's nature exists on three levels. First, the Buddha is a historical being in an earthly form. Second, Siddhartha Gautama gained the Buddha, uh, the Buddha nature and therefore transcended the limits of human's inner human ignorance. A popular greater path text known as the Lotus Sutra explains that the Buddha nature has manifested to liberate humanity from this world of wearying, ego grasping, and illusion. Third, the Buddha exists in Nirvana, a state of complete oneness with all that is true. For non-Buddhists, the concept of Nirvana can be hard to grasp 
because it describes something that cannot be described, a void without distinctions, a unity of essence beyond explanation. The Lotus Sutra explains that Buddha chose to delay entry into nirvana, which is pure bliss, in order to teach others the true path. A person who does this is called a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva vows to dedicate themselves to using their own awakening for the sake of others. Bodhisattvas are guides as numerous as the sands of the sea who lead people step by step into insight. Buddhist mythologies describe many bodhisattvas, including one angel named Saman Subhadra, who swaggers across the skies on a fierce white elephant looking to help people in times of need. Another supernatural being, the devilish Kashit Garba, is a Buddhist master over hell whose mission is to torture all evildoers for crimes. One of the most famous bodhisattvas is Maitreya, who will uh, one day return to Earth. Maitreya is the world teacher who will arrive at the perfect time to serve all believers the elixir of enlightenment. Uh, this messianic figure's return, only for a brief visit, will be humanity's finest moment, bringing about a golden age of prosperity and long life, where people will live at least 8,000 years. So this obviously has parallels with the concept of the return of Jesus, the Messiah, and uh, the millennium or the kingdom of God that's coming that will last for a, a thousand year golden age. And then eventually uh, heaven will descend to earth and which will be eternity and uh, paradise with uh, face to face with God. Okay, let's look at the birth and childhood of the Buddha. According to an Indian poet, before entering humanity, Buddha waited in a heavenly realm where each day lasted over 400 years. Finally, Buddha entered the womb of his mother, Maya, and was born among the Sakya tribe near the Ganges River in modern-day Nepal. Siddhartha's father, Sudha Dena, was a benevolent raja who ruled the small kingdom of Kapila Vista. Although the king was wealthy, he was miserable because his wife was unable to provide a male heir. Finally, on the day of a full moon in May, the kingdom celebrated the supernatural birth of Siddhartha Gautama. It was a miracle because his parents had not had sexual relations. Uh, the year of his birth is often cited as 623 BCE, though others cite 560 or 448 BCE. Tragically, Siddhartha's mother died seven days after her baby was born. The care of the prince fell to the queen's sister, who raised him as if he were her own. After his birth, one priest observed that the newborn took seven steps in the seven directions and announced that he had been born for enlightenment and the good of the world. When Siddhartha was five days old, the king summoned a hundred sages to pay homage to the boy and predict his future. Most prophesied that the prince would expand his father's kingdom with glorious military victories. One named Asita, however, prophesied that Siddhartha would, become, would either become a great king or, if exposed to suffering, would renounce wealth and become a wandering teacher who would turn the Dharma wheel of truth, meaning to spread teaching. Asita's prophecy disturbed the king, who decided to shield his son in seclusion, where it would be impossible to see suffering. Anyone who was sick was not allowed in Siddhartha's presence. Further, Siddhartha's chariot driver was forbidden to take the boy outside the palace walls. One lesson from the story is that we cannot shield those we love from the harsh realities of life. The father was guilty of trying to trap his son into an unawakened lifestyle upheld by illusions. Siddhartha was provided every comfort 
including an umbrella to always shield him from the harsh sun. He was carried through his father's rice fields in a lavish cart, befitting a prince, moving to a different mansion each season. Each palace was filled with lavish perfumes and dancing maidens. Prince could beckon musicians at any time and enjoy the most delicious foods imaginable prepared by skilled chefs. He excelled in swimming, wrestling, fencing, archery, hunting within forests of mango and tamarind trees, and fishing in mountain streams. He also received lessons in literature and the arts of warfare. When Siddhartha was about 12, he was taken to a temple to be dedicated to God. When he was 16, his father arranged a marriage with a girl of 14, Bashandara, a beautiful maiden of the warrior class. The king gave lavish gifts to the couple, including three new palaces. Let's look at the great going forward. Inevitably, Siddhartha disobeyed his father's order not to leave the palace grounds. His tranquil life was filled with boredom, and he felt restless to know what was being hidden from him. In a series of adventures, the prince escaped the palace and saw the four passing sights. He first saw a feeble, senile old man. Second, he saw an invalid, racked with pain and deformity. Third, he saw a somber, somber uh, funeral procession filled with weeping mourners who taught him the reality of death. The fourth sight was of a group of begging sages renouncing the world in search of the truth. Siddhartha realized that what had been presented to him about life was an empty facade and that all his possessions were distractions that slowed his search for truth. He was impressed that these monks had turned their backs on everything he had enjoyed, and so he joined their efforts to explore the realms of the spirit. At age 29, deep longings swelled in Siddhartha's heart. Everything inside of him cried out for change, and even the natural world seemed to crave transformation. The prince reached a breaking point of despair when his wife gave birth to a son named Rahula. When he told his father of his desire to become a wandering monk, the king replied that he could follow the path only after he had met all his responsibilities as a father. One night, Siddhartha fled the palace. His final act as a prince was to enter his wife's bedroom and kiss her and his baby. He had decided to leave all that was familiar and not return until he found peace. The prince cut his hair and left the palace in search of a teacher. This event is called the Great Going Forth or Renunciation. On his first day of exile, the prince met a beggar who exchanged his rags for the prince's silk robes covered in jewels. Siddhartha was beginning a spiritual search similar to the one undertaken by Abraham in the Old Testament, in the uh, Christian Bible, uh, who also fled the comforts of home in an uncertain quest. As was true of Jesus and Muhammad, the path of prophetic destiny often begins when a person decides to forsake the activity of everyday life and choose a path of revolutionary effort. Siddhartha spent the next six years wandering with a group of monks who lived in the jungle, exposed to the extremes of heat and cold, sleeping on the ground or on beds made of thorns. He ate so rarely that he became gaunt. Most of his time was spent meditating and studying the Vedas, or the Hindu scriptures. Um, Siddhartha entered long trances and practiced various techniques of yoga, which tied spiritual power to human effort. His father and wife sent priests in search of the prince to plead that he return home. When they found him, they reported that Siddhartha was already dead to the world. Let's turn to the section on enlightenment, or the Buddha's enlightenment. After many years, even though Siddhartha had perfected every skill in meditation, he was no closer to his goal of enlightenment. All his efforts left him unsatisfied, filled with a sense of failure and lack of liberation. He was only weakening his health. Siddhartha, now 38 years old, decided he would no longer fast 
and said farewell to his company of monks who questioned his level of commitment. Siddhartha walked to the edge of the Naranjana River and decided to rest. Soon, a village woman approached him with an offering of rice milk, which he accepted. The next day, he wandered into the village of Bad Gaya in North India, where he rested under the arms of an ancient fig tree along the banks of the Falgu River. He sat down under the Bodhi tree's trunk and faced eastwards, deciding not to move until he gained spiritual wisdom. While waiting in meditation, Siddhartha encountered many temptations. The devilish goddess Mara counseled him to deny all wasted efforts and return to a quiet life of wealth and ease at the palace of his father. Mara was a cunning fool who tried different strategies to lead Siddhartha astray, including trying to persuade him that the new ideas he had discovered were too complicated to be grasped by ordinary folks, so he should keep them to himself. Other attacks were more direct. Maya launched ten armies of horrible demons to swirl around Siddhartha. When these efforts failed, Bara sought to seduce Siddhartha with visions of dancing maidens. Siddhartha realized that even these beauties would decay into old hags before transforming into rotting corpses. In other words, everybody's eventually going to die. Um, so each attack, each attack spawned a new revelation into the passing nature of life. Siddhartha saw himself and all of life um, as a vast process of becoming an extinction. And he recognized as ridiculous the idea of the, exist, of, um, of the existence of an individual ego. Um, so it's ridiculous to think that for someone to think that they are an individual and separate from everything else. In a moment of insight, he touched the ground with his hand. This contact with the, the truth of solid earth forced the demons to flee. Enlightenment was a victory over evil, a triumph of soul and spirit over the body. His motionlessness became the revolutionary pivot point of humanity, or of history. Siddhartha Gautama became Buddha. Past lives splashed before him. He viewed all the world's suffering and was filled with compassion. Later, on the first night of this exalted state, Buddha received the first truth as an enlightened soul. From good must come good, and from evil must come evil. He saw the universality of suffering. All rituals, prayers, incantations, and devotional sacrifices were pointless. Suffering came from attachments and desires. The social caste system was invalid, and the Hindu teaching that the world was created by Brahma was false. The world never began and never would end. Desire could be quenched, and a path was available towards freedom. For the next days, Buddha sat silently and received revelation. Now, empty of himself, Mind and soul and heart were filled with wave after wave of purifying insight. On the second night, Buddha received a revelation that life is a constant cycle of birth and rebirth. During the third night, Buddha received the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, which would lead people to nirvana, a state of existence comparable to cooling off after a fierce fever. These moments of enlightenment brought Buddhism to birth. Supreme wisdom had entered a mortal and changed that man into something more than a mere mortal. In a moment, enlightenment tore down false notions that each of us is separate, incomplete, and imperfect. Let's look at a mission to teach. Buddha withdrew into the jungle where he again confronted Mara, the evil one. Mara suggested that Buddha pass immediately into his rightful reward of bliss without uh, teaching because humanity was incapable of understanding his message. Mara also tempted Buddha to turn the Himalayas into gold and perform other miracles. Buddha responded by touching the earth again, and once again the temptress fled. Buddha stayed beneath the Tree of Enlightenment for seven weeks, 
where it would have been easy to linger within the warm glow of peaceful realization. Instead, he decided to teach a decision that was counterintuitive. After traveling to Varanasi, Buddha sought out the five monks he had known from his wanderings, and he found them three miles north of the city at Deer Park. When they recognized him, they called him by his name Siddhartha and assumed he had returned to them as a weak-willed backslider. Instead, Buddha told them that his new name was now Tathagata, the truth attained one. The name Buddha was widely used at that time to describe a great teacher, and this became the name people used to honor his message. The wheel of Buddhism was set in motion with his first sermon at the, uh, the Deer Park. The message that he preached led to his first follower, Kodera, uh, who gained a glimpse of Nirvana and entered the stream toward truth. Four other monks, former monks, also began to follow Buddha. Uh, from those first five came 55 other saints who became arhats, attaining enlightenment. Buddha taught another lesson that became known as the Fire Sermon. This sermon explaining human nature was repeated uh, by followers as they dispersed to persuade others. Soon, thousands of new believers embraced the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Even Buddha's father and family joined the new community. For the next 45 years, Buddha wandered up and down India's Ganges River or Ganges Valley, delivering 84,000 sermons that addressed life's 84,000 distinct problems. The Buddha's teachings were so gripping that listeners never even coughed or cleared their throats while Buddha was teaching. Now, again, keep in mind that this chapter is has a lot of legendary elements. I'm not going to claim that this is all factual or historical. This is just uh, the best account that we have or based on the information we have, uh, which does present these fanciful ideas or probably legendary elements as well. Uh, so we can assume it's all factual history, but it is just the, uh, the best account we have of Buddha's life, or according to the best accounts we have. Uh, powerful critics emerged who attacked the new message. Religious leaders noted it was scandalous that he had left his wife and children to become a wandering teacher. One of his early Followers even tried to assassinate Buddha, making many unsuccessful attempts. Women also became interested in Buddha's teachings and requested that nunneries be established. The request was granted, though one questionable tradition claims that Buddha hesitated before allowing for this development. So in other words, we don't know if that really happened, but one source says that uh, Buddha was kind of hesitant or did not want women to establish these uh, nunneries or these female monasteries uh, or monastic groups. After traveling on foot for over four decades across India, Buddha's body had worn out. He retired to a monastery to spend the rest of his life in teaching and meditation. Even then, his teaching style was energetic. One of his strengths was the ability to adapt instructions to each audience by telling stories and sharing parables, kind of similar to how Jesus did that. Whenever Buddha was given a question, he always responded with patience. With a singular focus, Buddha tirelessly emphasized that the darkness of our age could be overcome by hearts filled with loving compassion. Let's turn to entering nirvana. When Buddha reached 80 years of age, his body bore the marks of a wearying struggle. His time to enter the ultimate nirvana was near. When a farmer unintentionally gave Buddha some rancid, poisonous mushrooms, he accepted the offering, sent words to forgive the farmer, 
and told his students it was time to abandon his earthly body. Buddha's final lesson ended by announcing that he had taught what he had experienced fully for himself. Um, his earthly work was done. And he had no need for any further births, meaning uh, to be reincarnated according to what Hindus taught and Buddhists uh, adapted that teaching to a large extent. <laughs> a community had been launched that would continue sharing the teaching to those who sought freedom from deceptions. Buddha then lay down among a grove of trees, fell into a deep trance-like coma, and left this life. Even his death was an impartational event, showing followers how to die with grace and dignity. Let's look at the life given as a gift. In Buddha's life, compassion takes form. The focal point of devotion for millions, Buddha is misunderstood if seen as a type of figure who appeared on the earth with superhuman qualities. Or in other words, not a real human, maybe like a Superman type figure. Uh, each of us has the potential to fully express our inner, inner Buddha nature. Buddhiz uh, Buddhism's central tenet is that his experience of truth can become our reality. Many Hindu and Jain teachers recognize Buddha as an avatar, meaning an embodiment um, of the Indian god Krishna. So just so you know, Hinduism is the main religion, uh, the traditional Indian religion um, of the Indian people. And Buddhism, of course, emerged from that. And also Jainism emerged. That's a different religion. It does still have a lot of similarities to Hinduism, but there are some differences as well. Uh, so both of those religions incorporated Buddha and saw him as this representation or this embodiment of the god Krishna, a very important god for Hinduism. Uh, many Jews, Muslims, and Christians recognize that Buddha was a great teacher and a prophet of Moral virtue, Buddha is not a god, but was also not an ordinary man. He can be seen as a word of truth or an expression of truth, um, a conqueror of the world's evils, or a prophet who spoke with clarity from the heart. The life and message of Buddha are vaster than the oceans, a gift to all humanity. So this concludes our lecture. Again, this is... Presenting um, the Buddhist teachings, uh, not saying that uh, we that Christians believe all these things, but this is just trying to to overview and survey uh, Buddhist teachings and uh, the concept of who Buddha was, what his life was like. Uh, <laughs> and we'll continue that uh, next week in the first part, first few weeks of the class. Actually, now for your attendance assignment this week. Uh, this is, again is necessary to to get credit for attendance and to get uh, points each week. I do calculate the points and that goes towards your final grade. But you should have a certain amount of a uh, attendance. So please write one to two paragraphs or one page maximum. So no more than one page. Uh, what is the main idea you took from this week's lecture? So that's going to be the same question I ask for each of these assignments. So this assumes that you have watched the lecture, that you followed along, and uh, that you've learned something. And so just write about something you've learned. So please uh, just write something very briefly. Don't go and don't uh, you don't need to use other sources. So please don't go online to look up some other article and copy and paste the whole article. I've had students that seem to do that. That's not what I'm looking for. I want you to write something in your own words, uh, preferably complete sentences, but one or two paragraphs just to write about something that you've learned. You don't have to summarize everything. Uh, you can 
survey a little bit, but if you want to write just one or two main ideas, that's fine too. Uh, again, uh, uh, no more than one page. Now I give some extra credit assignments each week. Uh, for this week, the extra credit is write one to two paragraphs. And again, no more than one page, one page maximum to answer these two questions. Uh, what is your understanding of interfaith dialogue? Describe any experience you have had in conversation with others who hold religious views different from your own. So um, if you're Christian, um, have you had religious conversations with uh, Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims or Jews or other religious groups? Um, if you're Buddhist, have you had conversations with Christians or, or Muslims or Hindus or Jews? And of course, if you're not religious, if you have no, no religious backgrounds or have no religious beliefs yourself, have you had conversations with those that do whatever religion they may belong to? So that's the question, uh, number one. Number two, what makes Buddha such an important figure in the history of the world? Why is he so influential? Um, you can write some about his life or some of his teaching, um, just whatever makes him in your, uh, in your opinion, what, what makes him uh, so important or so influential? So if you do both assignments, the attendance and the extra credits, it should be no more than two pages maximum. Uh, or it could even be as short as uh, two paragraphs, I suppose, at the very, very least. Uh, but I do ask you to write complete sentences. Don't just uh, list a few phrases or the headings of the, the sections we've covered actually try to write out some some uh full sentences that express your ideas um, in your own words as best so please send that to me by email in the next next week or so uh to get credit for attendance now if you ever have any questions about the class feel free to ask me um write it in the email to ask me and if you want a copy of the syllabus or the lecture notes feel free to Ask me for those as well. Uh, anyways, I hope you uh, enjoy the, the first uh, lecture and hope you enjoy the rest of the class and are learning something. This is a new class for me. I'm learning a lot as we go as well. Uh, I've taken at least one class in world religions, uh, but I'm not an expert on Buddhism at the moment, so I'm learning quite a bit myself as we go through this. And hopefully I can learn to dialogue with uh, with Buddhists or maybe in the future I'll encounter some of you that might be Buddhists and we can have more dialogue. Uh, I would look forward to that, definitely. Uh, so again, welcome to spring term uh, 2023. This is the first of our uh, 10 week or of our, our 10 sessions. And uh, so look forward to meeting with you for the next nine sessions over the next few months. And uh, hopefully we learn this together. Uh, all right. Take care. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.